earlier this year, I, um, I walked into the chapel of Queen's College um, carrying a, an easel over my shoulder um, to set up an image for um, the Lent concert. Um, Jan has been organizing these, these Lent concerts in, in Queen's for almost 20 years now. Um, but I'd, for some reason I'd muddled the time and I r arrived just, um, I sort of blundered into the chapel just at the moment that the, um, the musicians were rehearsing uh, Allegri's Miserere. <laughs> Gregorio Allegri's sublime setting um, of the psalm um, that we, we sort of sung this morning. Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is, is, is perhaps the, the deepest and most profound psalm of repentance in the whole Psalter. But Allegri's setting is so intensely beautiful uh, that I've heard it described as a, a sort of proof of the existence of God. Allegri actually sang as a, a, a tenor in the Sistine Chapel choir, uh, and his, his Miserere was, and I believe still is, um, sung there in Holy Week uh, in the, the service of Tenebrae, during which uh, at each stage during the service, uh, another candle is extinguished. Tenebrae means darkness, until finally the last candle is extinguished and the Allegri is, is sung in, in complete darkness, allowing it, you to hear it uh, as it were, uh, as though it is sung to you personally, it's addressed to you personally, as, as it, it seemed to be when I went into the chapel and heard the, the Miserere as an audience of, of one. It allows you to hear Psalm 51 addressed to you personally, and of course it is. The, the superscription in Psalm 51 describes it as a psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, which is the story uh, that Barbara read to us. The story of how after uh, David had allowed, had Uriah uh, killed and taken his wife, the prophet Nathan comes to him and tells him that story about a poor man with the single ewe lamb like a daughter to him who is then taken by the rich man. And when David is, is angry uh, by the, the man's lack of pity, Nathan says to him, you are the man. And I suppose that that is how, for the most part, we are meant to hear the scriptures, not as general advice uh, addressed to other people, but as a message addressed personally to us, a story in which we are a principal actor. You are the man, you are the woman. Uh, and of course, that can be deeply uncomfortable, particularly when it involves facing up um, to some way in which we have fallen short uh, or wandered from the path. And that's something which not only we personally, but our whole culture is, is deeply uncomfortable with. There was a very fascinating public debate um, the other month uh, between two people who had been part uh, of the group who um, had become known as the, the New Atheists. One of them um, was Oxford's uh, own Richard Dawkins, uh, and the other uh, was Ian Hersey Alley. Um, who was uh, brought up in Somalia as a, a member of the, the Muslim Brotherhood um, and was a very committed member, but then ran away um, when um, she was 
forced into a, about to be forced into a, 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 an arranged marriage, and went to Holland and went to university and became a Dutch MP uh, and, and wrote a best-selling book called Infidel, uh, and, and then became um, one of the world's best-known atheists. Now, Richard has, has so far remained stuck as an atheist, but Ian has very recently become a Christian. And in the debate, um, Richard said that she must surely agree that Christianity was a religion obsessed with sin. And many in our culture would agree with that. But Ian's response was that, that no, she had found that Christianity was a religion obsessed with love. And at the heart of it was a story of redemption, a story that is focused on renewal and rebirth. And if it diagnoses the things that our, our flaws and our missteps, which it certainly does, it is in order to bring us healing, to bring us from darkness to light. Paul, in our, our reading from Ephesians, talks about speaking the truth in love. And that surely is what is happening um, when Nathan, God sends Nathan to David. Nathan is speaking the truth, a truth which David perhaps thought that no one else knew, in love to bring David back to himself. The story in our gospel reading follows shortly after Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman when, as she puts it, he told me everything that I ever did, speaking the truth in love. And in that story, Jesus promises that whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. There, the image was of water, but here, the image is of bread. Do not work, he tells them, for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life. The God who knows us better than we know ourselves, who sees into our deepest hearts and sees our deepest flaws is also the God who loves us, who longs to satisfy our deepest hunger, who is himself the root of all our desire. When they ask him what they must do, what are the works of God, he replies, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. When they ask him to give us this bread always, he replies, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the, the first of the, the I am sayings in John's Gospel. I am, ego I mean in Greek, which echoes the name of God revealed to Moses. I am who I am. But f is filling it with a new revelation of God's nature. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this first saying, I am the bread of life, 
is repeated three times. And over the next three weeks, we will hear each of those repetitions in our gospel readings. And with each of those repetitions, we're taken, as it were, a step nearer to the communion rail, to the Last Supper, to the bread broken and the wine poured out, and to the place where all the darkness of the world meets a logic of love at the heart of reality into which we are invited. Psalm 51, as I said at the, at the beginning, is a response to Nathan speaking the truth in love. And in the final verses of the psalm, it says that the, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken spirit and a contrite heart you will not despise. So what should our response be to the words of Jesus? Well, the crowd's response is a good one. Master, they said, give us this bread. Give it to us always. That is a, a prayer that we all need to pray if our deepest needs are to be met. Master, give us this bread. Give it to us always. Amen.